license and registration, he can sense your aggravation. The head of the fallen angel. The world is muttering the under the, the floorboards. Stomp even louder. On time. Let them know you are alive today. Or unhum. Did you know that your hands came with a ripple effect? Whisper tones unraveling like silk. Blood, sweat, and tears win by any means, poetry. Sway, look at me. Is a piece of the pie too good for me? Some may call it brought the mic. We call it poetry. We were warned not to go inside that dilapidated farmhouse. Boards weather faded gray by time, contrasting vastly with the pink powder puff blossoms of the exotic mimosa tree growing just 40 feet from her once canary yellow front door. Crooked window frames no longer holding glass caused pushing sounds on cold, rural, wind-filled nights. But summer days filled with bright sunshine ignited gleeful childhood minds ripe with explorer's excitement. Once inside, we climbed through, over, and under broken boards, inspecting openings that where once sturdy floors once lay, but on this day, too dried wood would cave, even from gingerly placed juvenile footsteps. Where doors once stood, now only cobwebbed openings leading to half-missing stairs, ascending to dust-filled bedrooms and forgotten dreams, plead to be rediscovered. Risking rusted nails, bats, and black snakes, perils unknown to, or at least unheeded, by seven and nine-year-olds in search of treasure, Pudgy fingers excavating through decades of undisturbed dirt to find elegant glass jars, green and cracked handleless cups. Try to clean abandoned pans and chipped dinner plates with the past yellow now brown, crumbling newspaper announcing the new general store grand opening on June 23, 1925. News that lined those shelves for more than 60 years. Never could find the mate to a shoe, found decaying in a corner near what must have once been a bright bedroom. Her once yellow gingham curtains, now tattered and faded brown. Of course, we couldn't take anything outside. Had to hide our finds amidst the dust till the day we were found out and grounded for weeks were seeking treasures where yesterday awaited innocent but intrepid looters, lifting loose and dusty floorboards in search of something new. Hello, welcome. This is Sojourn with Words. I'm your host, Sister Joy, and today we have a wonderful poet from Washington, D.C., 
And we hope that you know her already because she's such a force in the nation's capital, especially in the literary scene, but broader than that. I'm speaking of Kim Roberts. Uh, Kim is, well, first of all, let me welcome Kim. Welcome to Sojourn with Words. Oh, thank you so much. Great to be here. Oh, we're happy to have you. Now, viewers, family, this is Kim. Kim is an award-winning poet editor and literary historian who resides in Washington, DC. She is the author of six books of poems, editor of two anthologies and co-editor of the web exhibit, DC Writers Homes. Now, Kim is the editor of the anthology by Broad Potomac's Shore. And let me say that properly now, by Broad Potomac's Shore great poems from the early days of our nation's capital. And that's out through University of Virginia Press 2020. The book was selected by the East Coast Centers for the Book for 2021. Route one reads, program, <laughs> that's a mouthful. But anyway, we're going to hear about that anthology. It, it was listed as the best well, a book that best illuminates important aspects of the culture of Washington, D.C. That's a mouthful, and it gives you something about the expertise of our featured poet today. Now, Kim is the author also of A Literary Guide to Washington, D.C., Walking in the Footsteps of American Writers from Francis Scott Key to Zora Neale Hurston, and that's out by University of Virginia Press 2018. Whew, Kim has been busy. She is the author of six books of poems, most recently, The Scientific Method, Word Tech Editions, 2017. Her chat book, Corona Crown, a cross-disciplinary collaboration with photographer Robert Revere, and that's coming from Word Tech Editions in 2023. And there's so much more, but of course, you can always visit her website, kimroberts.org. And we'll hear more about that directly from Kim herself. Kim, wow, you're one busy lady, and we see why you're such a force in the nation's capital. Again, welcome. You are so sweet. Thank you. Oh, we're very excited about this interview. Kim, I've known you for many years, and I'm just thrilled to be finally able to have you on Sojourn with Words. Now, we have a couple of things that we know about you, but but I want to ask, when we talk about this, the anthologies that you do and, and the fact that you're a D.C. literary historian, that's that's very intriguing to me. Why is research so important to you? And, and and how does it influence your writing? Well, <laughs> you know, I guess there are a couple of ways to answer this. I, I do think that it is crucial that we all know who our literary forebears are. And, and you know, like any art form, it's, it, it's really so important to know who came before and what they accomplished and to let that work influence our own creative imaginings. But also, you know, I just happen to, to be the kind of person who loves hanging out in dusty archives. I, I love doing the research and looking at the history of writers from Washington, D.C. specifically, allows me to have a, a, a deeper connection to a sense of place that I call home. And it also connects up some other things that I love. You know, I, I love American history. I love the history of cities and urban places and the built environment. So when I look at, for example, where different writers in DC have lived, you know, that that combines all of these interests together. When I did the research for my anthology by Broad Potomac Shore, that book covers the period from the city's founding in 1800 
up until uh, right about 1930. So after that time, we get into literary modernism and things change really dramatically. But I really felt like those earlier stories were not as as well known or as often told. And so for me, it was also a way to celebrate a history that is what? less visible and these stories really deserve to be told. So, you know, in that anthology, I included some famous writers. Of course, Walt Whitman is in there and Paul Lawrence Dunbar is in there. But I also was really interested in finding out a little bit more about some of the poets who are less well known. And in particular, I was looking for poetry by women, working class poets, poets of color, LGBTQ poets, you know, these these sort of bringing forward some of the, the poets who I think their work is just as brilliant as some of the the poets who, you know, are still taught and read regularly. So for me, a lot of it was also just sort of what, uh, uncovering these worthy forebears who have been a little more forgotten. What was your process for, for unearthing these writers for rediscovering? I mean, oh my goodness. Well, so part of it is that, uh, of course, you know, writers group themselves together. We make community. We develop friendships. When you go through the the archives of a well-known poet and you look at who they were writing letters to, gotcha. You know, then then you start to find who who their network was. So one poet would lead to other poets. Yeah. And I also looked a lot at newspapers of the period, especially some of the specialty newspapers. When I was looking at, for example, the Civil War period in D.C., many of the Civil War hospitals had their own newspapers. There were, of course, some really famous abolitionist newspapers in D.C., There, you know, so some of these specialty papers would publish poems in every issue. And so, you know, that was a great way to to uncover more more poets. It, It was just sort of delving into sort of networks and communities. It was really exciting to me to do to do the research. And Quite frankly, I've been doing this research. I started when I first moved to the D.C. area, which was, what, 35 years ago, I think. So uh, actually, you know, this book was a long time coming because for me, it was just I started it for personal reasons of my own personal growth. I wanted to know who were the poets who were here before me. Let's shift a bit going from what brought you to this. uh, But let's talk a little bit about the current times. Uh, How has your writing changed during the pandemic? This is something that has affected every writer in some form or fashion. So talk to us about, you know, I won't say has your writing changed, because to me, it's a given that every writer, (laughs) their, their craft has been influenced by this experience, this phenomenon of the pandemic. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's been... In so ways, so many ways, such a difficult time. And there are, we still don't know how many losses there will be. We don't know what the continuing. I was very fortunate during the pandemic to have the company of my girlfriend. I fell in love during the pandemic. And that made a huge difference. I, I know so many of my friends who are single really felt so isolated um, during the pandemic. And to, to have the, the, the company of someone so special during this time, you know, 
I'm not sure if I would have made it through the pandemic nearly as successfully as I did. Uh, I'm just so grateful. And so what I started doing was uncharacteristically started writing a lot of love poems and writing. My writing got much more personal during the pandemic. It was, uh, I started doing much more risk taking. And I also started playing around in ways that I hadn't allowed myself to before. I think what the pandemic did for me was clarified what my priorities are in a certain way. So, you know, you mentioned that that chapbook that is coming out that is a collaboration with a photographer friend. We had talked about wanting to do something together forever, but it took the pandemic for us to finally say, okay, now's the time. Now we're going to do it. Well, let's talk about the, your photographer, Robert Revere, I believe is his name. And in the collaboration in Corona Crown, talk us about that. Yeah, so (laughs) Rob had started doing this series of photos over many years of people interacting with cultural sites and museums. And both of us were feeling very strongly the the loss of, uh, you know, for me, going to museums is, it's, it's one of the major ways that I... It's it's how I spend my leisure time, and okay. and that was just gone. They were closed. All of these these cultural spaces were closed, and so Rob and I decided to, in a sense, make our own museum. And he went back to this series of, of photos that photographs he'd been working on, and started reworking them, redeveloping them seeing them in as a series in a different way. We uh, started talking about a sort of order for them. And then I wrote a, a, a long poem in response. It's, uh, you know, about sonnet crowns, right? Where there is 14 poems in a row, they're numbered. Usually the, the first line is, of each section was the last line of the previous section, right? So I decided I would do a prose poem version of a sonnet crown so that they are prose poems so that they line up on the page like little boxes. So they look sort of like the photographs. They look like something framed. But I I did use the form where, you know, the last line from the section before becomes the first line in the section below. And the final section you reuses all of those lines again. So there is some form to it that, that holds it together, but it's all about looking. It's all about engaging in with, with visual art and culture. Yes. Okay, so this this is a cross disciplinary type of collaboration, right? Right, yeah. And he finished the series, you know, in conversation with me. I wrote this uh, new poem in conversation with him. You know, it was very much about the, the the way we talked it through with one another. It really was a true collaboration. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, I'm excited about it. It's it's fun. And what? And now, is this available currently, or is it soon to be? No, no, no. It's been accepted for uh, publication in winter of 2023. Okay. So it will come out. Oh, I don't know. Maybe about ten months from now. Gotcha. But it's it's in the works. Okay. Well, let's see. We have a few more minutes before we actually begin to hear your poetry. But I do want to ask about your upcoming projects beyond this particular cross-disciplinary collaboration with Robert Revere. What else is on the horizon for Kim Roberts? And for those that are just joining us, we're we're listening to Kim Roberts tell us her fascinating story about just the history of a writer who has embraced not just her own craft, but who has embraced other genre and, and is also sharing how she had managed to maneuver this this pandemic that all of us are so impacted by. So what's on the horizon, Kim? 
Well, so I continue to work with Dan Vera on updates of DC Writers Homes. That's a, a website where we're documenting where in the greater DC area writers have lived in the past. We're, we're only documenting homes that still stand and writers who have passed away. So we always say that the writer has to be dead, the home has to be alive. We're not doing the site of. So that uh, project continues. I am one of five poets in residence at the Arts Club of Washington in a residency that runs from January to June of 2023. Really so pleased to be one of this group of five with Sunu P. Chandy, Tanya Olson, Malik Thompson, and Dan Vera. And we'll be leading some free workshops. We'll have a big group reading to celebrate the end of the residency in June. I'm also working with a filmmaker, John Gann, on a project called DC Pride Poem A Day. And we will be releasing 30 short videos, one every single day during National Pride Month in June 2023. And those will be poems on the, the subject of heritage. Different poets will have interpreted that in, in different ways. So a bunch of projects coming up for 2023. Great. Well, we want to make sure we share your website again. That's www.kimroberts.org. And please, we invite our viewers to be in touch with Kim about what you've heard today and her appearance here on Sojourn with Words. But now we're going to actually get down to the brass tacks of hearing poetry by Kim Roberts. Kim, thank you again so much for being with us. And now the piece de resistance. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, I wanted to read some some newer poems, poems from a manuscript in progress. These are part of these, I, I had mentioned I've been writing all these love poems during the pandemic. So this is from that series. This first one is called Ghazal or Hazel. It's a Persian, ancient Persian form. My girlfriend looks alluring in her madras shorts, splayed out on the sheets in her madras shorts. I don't believe in drawstrings, my girlfriend says. I assure her one exists in her madras shorts. I admire her two-step in old brown slippers, a waggle from the hips in her madras shorts. The city of Madras is now called Chennai, the East India companies in her madras shorts. Frat boys back from Caribbean resorts love the cheap, strong cotton of her madra shorts. Before the pandemic, we were adults. Now she's in bed at nine in her madra shorts. In the bright plaid hues woven deft and light, in what passes for pajamas in her madra shorts. All night her furnace generates terrific heat from the pink pocket hidden in her madra shorts. This one is called Bermuda Fireworm. Consider the Bermuda Fireworm, a tiny marine invertebrate that Christopher Columbus described in 1492 as the flame of a small candle alternately raised and lowered against black water. Females, Glowing cerulean stars circle near the surface until males shoot up like tiny comets from the mucus tube homes where they sleep most of the year in anonymous benthic seabeds. In mating season, you can see their electric coils in the waves. Then the explosion like fireworks when they deposit their gametes. In preparation, all four of the male's eyes swell to twice their usual size. The better to see you with, my dear. Consider their complex in internal clock. Fireworms mate in swarms exactly 
57 minutes past sunset on the third evening after a full moon in summer. The females circle and pulse like a bioluminescent ruffle. Timing so exact, such striking regularity. Wouldn't it be lovely to know to the minute that your expectations will be met? Oh, wouldn't it though? <laughs> and then damselflies. My girlfriend and I, two old maidens in love, watch from the boardwalk on Roosevelt Island as damselflies swoop past in pairs. The male damselfly harvests his sperm, deposits it carefully in a set of organs on the underside of his slim abdomen. Do not ask why. He clasps a female by the neck as she twists her thorax into a U to receive his sperm. Contorted under clear lace, their bodies form a heart shape in the air. The female is a damsel, of course, but the male is a damsel too. Veined like an insect wing, the lace on my girlfriend's bra is a lure, even when she tries to call it mesh to downgrade her feminine adornments. The damsels dart over the river's surface, stop and hover, pick up iridescence. Past the boardwalk, they swoop in pairs. My girlfriend reaches over to rub my shoulders while I sneak a peek down her shirt. And then this last one, every line is used twice. There, they are, are, it's like a backwards and forwards. The lines meet in the middle. It's called another lapping refrain. There's an ocean inside my belly and you're making my tide rise. I want to apologize to the shore for my past indifference to its beauty. The curl of each wave tip imitates your lips. The moon nestles between your breasts. My belly answers your lapping refrain with my own lapping refrain. Between your breasts, my belly nestles like a moon. The wave tip of your lips is indifferent to its own beauty. I want to apologize to the shore, but you're making my tide rise inside the ocean in my belly. Okay. Well, Kim, thank you so much. What oh, thank you. Uh, inviting poetry. And where might, we know we have your website. And is there a, well, anything else that you want our viewers to know about Kim Roberts and, and the work that you do at, as a as a historian, as an anthologist, as a poet, as a, you tell us. <laughs> Actually, the website is the best sort of single place because there are links there to all these other projects that I've mentioned, as well as more information about my books. Okay. Well, thank you so very much. We're very cl glad to have you as a guest here on Sojourn with Words. This has been a quick half hour. So we, we certainly hope our viewers have enjoyed it as much and found it as intriguing as, as, as have I. We want to make sure that Anybody who wants to be in touch, please write Sister Joy at poet sister joy at aol.com. That's P O E T S I S T A H J O Y at aol.com. And let us know your feedback on our shows. And certainly, if ever there's an opportunity for us to share information with our guest poets, we're happy to do so. But Kim has already given us her website, so you can be right in touch with her as well. This is CTV's premier poetry program, Sojourn with Words, in our 17th year, no less. And we are thrilled that this, in the 17th year, we received our third Telly Award, a national recognition for excellence in the programming that we provide to our community. And of course, now that we're virtual, that community is worldwide. So be in touch, let us know what you think. 
Kim, thank you so much for being with us. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Oh, such an honor. Thank you for including me. Absolutely. Thank you so much. See you next time. In the meanwhile, what is it Sister Joy always says? Pick up that pen and keep writing.